All right. Well, uh, we'll begin. Happy Halloween. If you uh, didn't come in person, you missed out on some candy. But uh, but anyway, I hope uh, I hope you guys are having a good day and a good weekend, and uh, and we'll take a look. So this is the same uh, document, and we left off. I think we talked about samples and sampling, and what we want to get at is this concept of a sampling distribution. Now, an important distinction that we have to make is the difference between values that summarize samples, okay, which we call statistics, and values that are kind of properties of the population, which we call parameters. And, and so we use different symbols for each of these things. So you got, you have the mean of the sample, you have the mean of the population, and you have the standard deviation of the sample and the standard deviation of the population, the proportion of the sample and the proportion of the population. And they each have kind of different symbols. So we have Y bar or X bar. You know, we use Y and X almost interchangeably when talking about stuff. So we got X bar, Y bar. Over here we've got mu. This is uh, the Greek letter mu. Standard deviation is S. Over here we've got sigma. Proportions, we have P hat and P. That's kind of the accepted notation to talk about these, um, these parameters. All right, we already talked about this. Okay, so kind of the big idea with sampling distributions is that if I gave each of you the assignment to go out and get a random sample, um, even if all of you kind of followed the same process, where you go to the same population, maybe you have the same sample uh, uh, sampling frame, and you draw values from that uh, population at random, everyone's going to get a different sample. And because everybody gets different individuals randomly from that sample, everyone's sample mean, your statistics, will also be different. Okay? And so the question is, which sample means are more common and which sample means are less common, okay? And we, I think we answered these questions back on Monday and we said if the population has a mean of 16, if the population has a mean of 16, when we take random samples, we expect our samples to have means that are similar to 16. 15 sounds like it'll happen a lot, 13 could happen a lot, but a mean of 10 sounds like it's pretty unlikely. A mean of 8 and a mean of 3 are even more unlikely, if not practically impossible. Theoretically, we don't want to say anything is impossible, but kind of on a practical level, it feels impossible. It kind of it would be on the order of, you know, flipping heads 50 times in a row. You know, while it's not impossible, just kind of on a practical level, it feels like something like that will never happen with a fair coin. So the idea or the, the resulting distribution of which sample statistics are more common, which sample statistics are less common, is known as the sampling distribution. And in particular, if we're talking about y bar, the mean of a sample, the sample mean, we might say we have the sampling distribution of y bar. If, we have, if we're talking about which standard deviations are more common and which standard deviations are less common, we'd have the sampling distribution of S, the standard deviation. Um, and so this is, the sampling distribution would show us, you know, the probabilities that a random sample of a given size produces a particular value of the sample statistic. So just kind of, we can simulate what a sampling distribution could look like. And, uh, and we can simulate this by starting off with a population. And from that population, we're going to draw a random sample. And we're going to kind of simulate the idea of each person drawing a different sample. And every, every sample we're going to draw will have the same sample size, but every random sample we draw will have a slightly different y bar, will have a slightly different mean. And so if you do that, and you repeat it thousands of times, you know, random sample one, random sample two, random sample three, random sample four, random sample up to, you know, 5,000. Every single one will have a slightly different y bar, y bar one, y bar two, y bar three, y bar four, y bar five, 
all the way up to y bar 5,000. We keep track of all of those. We can kind of plot a histogram of the different y bars that we encounter. Some will be more common. Values around 16, we expect to show up frequently. Other values will be less common. Values around 10, less common. And then will we ever see a value of a y bar of 8? I don't know. Okay. So here's a little app that we can uh, visit online. And we can run this simulation. So this up top represents our population. Population with a mean of 16 and a standard deviation of 5. Right? And so we can see, you know, most of our values, practically all of them, are between, say, uh, 1 and 31. And 95% are between, you know, 6 and 26 and things like that. Okay? And so what I'm going to do is we're going to start off with samples of size 5. And you click animate it, and it's drawing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 values at random from here. And what you see is when I click this, most of the time the values are going to come kind of in the middle. Every now and then you'll see values come from far out there, right? So values out here happen only what? With a 5% probability. So probably every four or five clicks of this, we'll see a value fall all the way out, you know, kind of out, out at the edges. But most of the other time, most of your values are going to be somewhere between here and here. And yeah, every few clicks we're going to see a value fall all the way out there. Anyway, we take the mean of these five values. What is the mean of these five values? Well, it's going to be kind of in the middle of those. And we drop a little plot down there. Okay, here's another five values. All right. So yeah, we got one value that's pretty low, but the other four kind of came from the middle. And so when we calculate the mean of these five values, it ends up right here. Okay, so this this low value kind of brings that mean down a little bit. Let's tap it again. Here's one, two, three, four, five. All right, five values, all kind of from the middle. What's the mean? Boom, right there. All right, here's another five values. Again, most of these kind of came from the middle. And this time, the average of these ended up over there. And we can kind of keep repeating this. Whoops. So there's another five. We ask, what's the mean of these things? Just kind of coincidentally, all right? We're kind of like forming these stacks here. And so we can do like say five at a time instead of uh, doing them one at a time. I'm going to do five samples of five at a time. And I'm just kind of tapping away on the screen here. And we can see, you know, more and more of these values are getting sampled. And so here it is. Here's what it looks like after say 500, 600. Okay, well, I'm getting tired of tapping. Okay, this is the distribution after 700 samples of 5. Okay, now I can just kind of take the shortcut and say, all right, let's just do 10,000 of these things. Okay, so here it is after 20,000. This is the sampling distribution of the different means. It's the distribution of all of the different sample means. And what do we notice about this versus this? It's a lot more narrow, right? It's a lot more narrow. Right? And that makes sense because when you pick people one at a time, which is what we would have in the distribution and the population, is that individuals, you know, if we think about height, okay, this is average, this would be tall, this would be short, this would be really tall, and this would be really short, okay? You pick one person at random, you know, what's the probability you get someone really tall, okay? Well, there's not a ton of really tall people, but let's say, the top 2% of people are really tall, okay? So let's say the top 2% of people, we're going to call them really tall, and, uh, and that's going to happen 2% of the time, okay? But now we're taking random samples of 5. What's the, what's the probability that after you pick 5 people at random, your average is really tall, okay? Well, that pretty much means like all like out of the five people, probably at least four of them have to be really tall. Maybe one person is a little bit less than really tall, but the average still has to be kind of at that really tall thing. And so how often is that going to happen? Well, that's going to happen with very, very, very little probability because 
the probability of getting one really tall person is 2%. What's the probability of getting five really tall people at random or four really tall people at random? And that, that's a much lower probability, okay? And therefore, we don't see values, like if this is kind of the threshold of what it means to be really tall, we don't, that never happened, right? Even after 20,000 samples, we never got a sample where all five ended up having an average that was really tall. And kind of the most extreme value is after you average five values, this is about as high as we got, okay? Over here, this is about as high as we got. And that would kind of just fall under like kind of tall, okay? Kind of tall. It's like kind of tall for one person. It's taller than average, but for all five to end up with that average, you know, that, that seems to be a fairly rare event, okay? So what do you think would happen if I increased my sample size instead of five to, say, 20? What would happen in my sampling distribution? It's going to get even more narrow. So I'm going to just click animated like maybe one or two times. So here, when you take a sample of size 20, you're likely going to get quite a big spread. You're going to get some values up here and down here and whatever. And when you take the average, the average ends up right there. I'll do this one more time. OK, out of 20 values, sure, we got a couple values that are pretty low. But then when you take the average, it ended up kind of being at the exact same spot. All right, I know I said I'd just do it one time, but if we do this again, we take the average of all 20, you know, it ends up over there. So let, let me go ahead and just start. We'll do um, five at a time. So what we get, let me just go ahead and click 10,000. So this is what it looks like after 30,000 samples it's a lot, it's narrow, right? So if we compare n equals 5, this is the distribution. n equals 20, that's the distribution, sampling distribution. And so with a larger sample, again, because you're drawing such a big sample, sure, you might get a couple individuals that are really tall or a couple individuals that are really short, but what's the probability that the entire sample has an average that's really low or an average that's really high? It, it becomes more and more rare for the entire sample average to be that extreme. So, so that's what we're seeing here, okay? And here's the other interesting thing. You can start off with a distribution that's uniform, okay? And if we uh, take just two at a time and say, give me the average, okay? I can do this now. Now it's all over the place because this entire thing is uniform up here. Okay. Look what happens. Samples of size two on this, they get a triangle, triangular distribution, okay, which seems a little strange. Okay. But if I take samples of size size five, okay. I end up getting something that looks kind of like the normal distribution. Samples of size 20 also looks a lot like the normal distribution here. Okay, And we could even have distributions that are not, like this is a very dichotomous distribution. If I take samples of size 2, I get like three peaks. <laughs> Samples of say five, and I end up getting this really weird distribution shape down here. At ten, I get something that also looks a little bit odd. Okay, here it is at sixteen. Here it is at twenty. And here it is at twenty-five. Okay. All right. What is, what is the point of all of this? Okay. Well, one, we saw this. Normal population, oh, I didn't do this, but samples of size two had this, samples of five, size five had this, ten, and 16 would have this. And what we're seeing is as the sample sizes grow, the resulting distribution shrinks.
I actually ran a simulation on my computer, and you can kind of take a look at this code. This uses a for loop, kind of keep track of this. But I said, hey, let's start off with a uniform population up top, meaning all values 0 and 32 and 17 and 8 and 3, all of those are equally likely to appear. Samples of size 2 gives me this triangle. Samples of size 3 gives me a little bit of a hill. And 4, 5, 6, 10, 20. And what we see is that as the sample size increases, we see a similar phenomenon of the thing getting more narrow. And more interesting is it ends up looking normal. Okay, Ends up looking normal, like a normal distribution. Did you have a question? Uh, yes. Yeah, when you have a bigger sample, outliers, well, basically, it's harder to get more extreme values, yeah. Um, at this point, with a sample of size 20, something like 25 would be considered an outlier, okay? Whereas in the population, 25 itself is just as likely as everything else. But when you take a sample of size 20, getting an average of 25 would be considered an outlier. Oh, okay. Yeah, why do we have a triangle when it's uniform? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, are you familiar with rolling dice? So, you, you have a die that has six sides, one, two, three, four, five, six. Every side is equally likely. So you can think of that as a uniform. Okay? What, what happens if you roll two dice? Okay? What's the distribution you have? How many, uh, so with two dice, you have 36 possible combinations. Okay. How many of those add up to seven? You have six. You got one six, uh, one six will add up to seven. Two, five, three, four, four, three, five, two, six, one. There's six, six ways to get seven. Okay. So you got six out of 36 to make a seven. How many ways to make uh, a six? Two dice to add up to six. There's five ways. Uh, one, five, two, four, three, three, four, two, five, one. Five ways to add up to six. How many ways to add up to five? There's four ways. How many ways to add up to four? There's three ways. Okay. And how many ways to add up to three? There's two ways. And how many ways to add up to two? There's one way. And if you plot them all out, there's one way to get a two, two ways to get a three, three ways to get a four, and it's un uh, it, it climbs up in this linear progression until you get to seven, where there's six ways to get a seven, and then and then there's only uh, five ways to get an eight, four ways to get a nine, three ways to get a ten, two ways to get an eleven, and one way to get a twelve, and and so it goes up and it goes down, and basically it's the same concept here. It's just. Uh, Instead of a six-sided die, it's like a 32-sided die. Okay? And that's all, right? And so we'd say, how many ways are there to get, uh, you know, if you have a 0 through 32, how many ways do you get 0? Well, there's only one way. You have to roll a 0 and a 0, okay? How many ways to add up to, say, 64, where your mean is going to be 32? There's only one way you get 32 and 32. How many ways to get an average of 16 where you get a sum of 32? Well, there's going to be uh, like 33 ways or 30, uh, however many ways, 32 ways to add up to 32. To add up to, yeah, add up to 32 where you get an average of 16. So you're going to have, and that's what you have there. Yeah. And anyway, you can, you can kind of go through and calculate what's the probability of getting this average or that average or that average, and then end up following this. Okay. Here it is with this dichotomous. You either get some very low values or very high values, and you end up getting kind of these three triangles. This is like if both of the values came from the low end, if both values came from the high end, and if one came from the high and one came from the low end, there's two ways, and that's why it's twice as tall. Uh, so anyway, when you have small samples, this looks all kind of wild and crazy. But once you reach samples of, say, size 25, the distribution looks normal. Once you reach samples of size 50, it definitely looks normal. Okay. So what we've discovered is that when you do this, the mean of the sampling distribution is equal to the 
population mean. The standard deviation of the sampling distribution, which we give it the name the standard error, shrinks as the sample size increases. Okay, So the standard error is sigma of y bar. Uh, I don't know why it says bar y, but y bar is sigma over the square root of n, meaning as your sample size increases, which is your n, as your n gets bigger, that's in the denominator, so this quantity is going to get go lower. All right? And that's, that's what we saw. As the sample size increased, we saw the sampling distribution shrink. Okay. And here's an interesting thing, is that the shape became normal as long as the sample size reached, got big. Okay? As long as the sample size got big, the shape became normal. And so we can say, when you take a sample mean, we might be able to say it comes from a normal distribution, centered at the population mean mu, or the standard error sigma over the square root of n. All right, so there's a mathematical theory, the central limit theorem. You're going to have to uh, probably prove it at some point, and if you're a data theory major, you'll take like uh, stats 100B or math 170 something, and you're going to have to prove some of these things. But the central limit theorem says no matter what kind of distribution you have, if your sample is large enough and the sampling distribution, uh, you know, it can be approximated, approximated by a normal distribution. Okay? Now what does it mean for it to be large enough? Okay. Well, if the population is normal, any size is large enough. We saw, we saw even though we had samples of size 2 or 5, the, um, the sampling distribution ended up being normal. Okay. But then when we had that dichotomous population, or the uniform population, a sample size of 2 wasn't big enough. Okay? And as, it, as if the population is not normal, a larger sample size, larger samples are required. Okay? In a lot of cases, a size of 25 is going to be big enough to kind of get the central limit theorem working. Okay? But in really skewed distributions, even a sample size greater than 25 is not going to be big enough. Okay? You're going to need or sample size of 25 is not going to be big enough if it's really skewed. You're going to have to you're going to need a really big um, sample size. Okay. Uh, another thing is, is you don't want your sample size to be too big in relation to the population. This is rarely an issue, just because usually your sample uh, population is really big, and, and we're getting a sample is, you know, you random sample is hard. Okay, and again, there's a caveat here. A lot of the data that you're going to be dealing with are not random samples. Okay, and so all of this mathematical theory, the central limit theorem is based on the assumption that you have a random sample. And so I'm teaching you a bunch of stuff, but then when you actually, like, when you're doing your data analysis project, it's probably not a random sample, okay? Like, like I'm going to ask you that question, right? During your project proposal, I'm going to say, hey, was this data obtained via a random sample or not? Probably your answer is going to be no, okay? But then you know what 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 kind of population could this generalize to or whatever you know I don't know all right so some of the uh, I think it's important to, that we learn a, a lot of this theoretic foundation but also understand that perhaps making these direct conclusions is not always um, maybe we can't do it okay in some of our certain circumstances here okay. Uh, this is just a quick example, making up some numbers here. So we'll just say the pulse rates of adult women in the United States are approximately normally distributed. I have no idea if that's true or not. It, it sounds like a reasonable statement to make, but I don't, I'm not a doctor. I don't, not that kind of doctor at least. Um, I don't know what, what is the case, okay? Uh, but we're going to just say there's the mean of 74 beats per minute standard deviation of 13 beats per minute. Again, these numbers are totally made up, but we're going to pretend, okay? And we're going to say, hey, what if I take a sample of 36 women, 
random sample. We measure the pulses of all of these people. And we're going to ask, what's the probability that this entire sample's average is under 71? Under 71. OK, so what do we do? Well, what we have to do is, well, first of all, we just, we're just we going to list off the information we have. Sample size of 36, mean of 74, standard deviation of 13. We want to know what's the probability that y bar is less than 71. And we're going to use the central limit theorem because our sample size is big enough. Well, first of all, it's big enough because it's normally distributed. Any, any sample size would have been fine. But we got a sample size of 36, so certainly that's big enough. And so when you set it up, the mean of your sampling distribution is 74. Standard error is 13 over the square root of n. So 13 divided by 6, we get 2.167. OK, and now we just want to know, hey, what's the probability of getting 71? All right, so if we go through a process, we get a z-score 71 minus 74. We'll divide 71. Our, the value that we're looking at is 71. Our mean is 74. We're going to divide by the standard error of 2.167. We get negative 1.38. We go to the table, and we get 0 0.0838 if we go to the normal reference table. OK. Or we could just go to R, R will start up on my computer. Okay, oops. So I'm going to just write P norm. And what do we have? We have 71, the mean is 74, and the standard deviation is 13 divided by 6, or the square root of 36. Okay? And it computes it out 8.3%, which I think is what we got. Around 8% probability. So why do you do 13 divided by square root of 36? Uh, because we are not asking, this is different. If, if I said, what is probability that uh, a, an individual woman has a pulse rate under 71, that would be P norm 71, 74, standard deviation equals to 13. Okay. And I would say all right, around 40, 41% of women have pulse rates under 71. Okay? But here we're asking, what's the probability that a sample of 36 women has a mean pulse rate under 71? Okay? Is the distinction between this and this clear? All right? And the sample will have this probability. So when we talk about one person, what's the probability that one person has a pulse rate under 71? A lot of people, 40% of people have pulse rates under 71. It's not that weird, okay? It's a little bit lower than average, but not that weird. But if we say, hey, I'm going to take a sample of 36 people, right? And we're going to calculate the average of all 36, okay? The average of all 36 is probably going to be closer to 74. How often is the entire average less than 71? That's only going to happen around 8% of the time. Okay? And, the, and so that's, and, and the reason why is because the standard deviation shrinks as you get a bigger sample. We divide by the square root of n, in this case 6. Square root of 36 being 6. Okay. All right. Does that, that kind of make sense to everybody? Okay. Uh, all right. I'm going to skip over these. Oh, let me give you your view quiz answers. Let's go ahead and give you your first two view quiz answers. They are B and E. B as in bear, E as in elephant. This is your first view, two view quiz answers. B as in bear, E as in elephant. OK, I'm going to uh, skip over this. The solutions are in here. You can kind of look over that. 
in your uh, in your own time. All right, I want to introduce this concept of a confidence interval. So we were just talking about sampling distributions. And what we established is that when you take a sample and you calculate the mean of your sample, the mean of your sample follows the normal distribution centered at the population mean. And so now, can we use that fact, that information, to help us make conclusions? Okay. So ultimately, our goal, at least in this segment of the course, is we want to make conclusions about the population based on a sample. And so, you know, in the prior example where we talked about the mean pulse rate and stuff, we, we said the population has a mean of 74. We said if we were to measure all the pulse rates of all women, of all adult women, their average is 74. How do we know that? We don't, okay? I made that number up, okay? And so that was a fake scenario where I said I know what the population mean is. That's almost never real life, right? In, in real life, we almost never know the mean of the population. And instead, we want to figure out what the mean of the population is, or at least make conclusions about the mean of the population. And so a more realistic scenario is you select a sample, you get a sample mean, and then you want to say, well, what does this tell me about the mean of the population? So let's say we get a sample. We're like studying butterflies. I don't know. This is. And the textbook had a butterfly example, a uh, different textbook had a butterfly example, so you, I'm following that. And it says we got a sample of random butterflies. I don't even know if this is even physically possible to get a random sample of butterflies, because what does that even mean? Like, do I have to go around the entire world and select random butterflies? I don't know, right? But okay, well, we'll say we got some monarch butterflies, which are quite common in North America. We get a random sample. I don't uh, again. Probably, if you capture some butterflies, they all like came from one nesting, brooding region or something. Do you, were you guys around like a few years ago? Where it's like this great butterfly migration across California. Every time you drove your car, it was like so sad because you'd park and then you, the front of your car was covered in butterflies and you felt so bad. But I mean, it was pretty. It was, I think. Um, Painted lady butterflies. Anyway, but I was always so sad to go driving because, well, anyway, uh, they just were trying to migrate. I don't, I don't know. Okay. Uh, so anyway, we're gonna say we got a sample of butterflies. We got sixteen of them. Somehow we measure the wing area of these butterflies, and I think. I think the only way you can really measure wing area of butterflies is you have to like kill the butterfly and you put them on a piece of graph paper and then you trace out the graphs and then you kind of shade in the squares. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like trying to calculate the area of some weird shape, you put it on like graph paper and then you shade in the squares and then you try to measure it that way. So anyway, we're going to say the average of these butterflies wings 30 centimeters, square centimeters. Okay. So what does this tell us about the average wing area of butterflies in the entire population? Like if I were to somehow go on a butterfly capturing rampage, capture all of them, and I measure all of the wing areas, and I get the average, what would that number be? My sample average is 30. What's the average of the entire population of all butterflies? Is it 30? Is it around 30? 32? 31? What is it, right? So is it equal to 30? Well, probably not going to be exactly equal to 30, but we kind of expect it to be close to 30. Close to 30, OK? And so maybe instead of trying to figure out exactly one number, it's better to create a little range, a little interval of values. And we're going to say maybe it could be between 28 and 32 or something like that. I don't know. Okay? All right, so put that thought on hold and behold my beautiful art. What is this? 
Yes, it's a picture of a dog. Oh, there's a caption. It's a picture of a dog on a football field, okay? And he's located at the 30-yard line, so what is a picture of? It's a picture of a dog on a football field at the 30-yard line. Now, also, this is an amazing picture because I've also in the picture is the dog's owner who happens to be the invisible man, okay? So the owner is invisible. Just go with this analogy, all right? I know it's ridiculous, but just go with it, okay? The owner is invisible, and there's also an elastic leash. The elastic leash is also invisible, okay? And so now you have the impossible task of answering the question, where is the owner? Where is the owner? Okay? And so if you think about this, this ridiculous question, there's a dog right there, okay? And we're saying he's going for a walk with his invisible owner. All we can say is, well, there's a leash, so the owner can't be super far away from the dog, okay? So what we can do is we can say maybe we don't know the exact location of the owner, right? We're never going to know exactly where the owner is, but we can expect the owner to be close to the dog because they're connected with a leash, elastic leash. Yeah, I guess it's stretchy, so maybe it could be far away, but most of the time this is what we have. Okay. And in fact, we studied the behavior of this dog, dog psychology, and we established this. The dog likes to stay close to the owner, like most dogs do, okay? This dog does not like to pull hard against the leash. All right, it's a good, good boy. All right, and we're going to, in fact, we've quantified this, and we said 68% of the time, the dog stays within one yard of the owner. All right, and 95% of the time, the dog stays within two yards of the owner. All right, and then what's the third sentence I'm going to write up here? 99.7 99.7 you guys know exactly where I'm going with this okay the dog stays within three yards of the owner okay and so therefore when we see the dog at the 30 we can make a statement like this we are 95% confident that the owner is between 28 and 32 okay because we know the behavior of the dog we don't know exactly where the owner is but if the dog's at the 30, and we know that 95% of the time the dog stays within two yards of the owner, I can be 95% confident that the, that the owner is between 28 and 32, within two yards of the dog. All right, and so this is, oh, now technically, could the owner be at, say, 32.5, more than two yards away from the dog? Yes. Okay? The owner could even be at 33.5, more than three yards away from the dog. Okay? But that would just be a little bit surprising to us because that means this picture was taken at one of those rare times where the dog chose to be more than two or three yards from the owner. It happens, but it, you know, it only happens a little bit of the time. Sometimes it happens and it's possible that we happen to snap that picture now, one of those rare moments where the dog was more than two yards from the owner. So it's possible. So we can't guarantee. We are not able to say for sure the owner is between 28 and 32, but we can say, yeah, you know, I'm 95% confident that that's going to be the case. All right? So this is what, why we call it a confidence interval. All right? So this is a silly analogy, but having uh, an observed sample with a sample mean and trying to make a co conclusion about the population mean is like, like this thing, right? The population mean is unknown to us. That's like the invisible owner. We don't know the exact location of the population mean, just like we didn't know the exact location of the invisible owner. Okay? But we do know the exact location of the sample mean y bar, like we do know the exact location of the dog. And the behavior of the dog being that most of the time y bar Stands clo stays close to mu is a lot like the dog staying close to the owner, okay? Because of the normal distribution, we know that y bar stays close to the population mean mu, right? And 95% of the time, y bar is within two standard errors of mu. And because we know that y bar stays within two standard errors of mu 95% of the time, we can be 95% confident 
that mu, the unknown population mean, is within approximately two standard errors of y bar. Does that analogy make sense? Does this conclusion here make sense? Okay, great, because we're going to run out of time. And so if we make a 95% confidence interval, we could take the values that we know, the mean of our sample y bar, and the standard error from the central limit theorem is sigma over the square root of n. Okay? And we go up, up or down two standard errors, technically 1.96. 1.96 is a slightly more accurate number than 2, and that will give us 95%. Okay? All right. Any questions on this? I feel like, um, do you guys know the David S. Pumpkins skit? Okay, nobody. All right. Saturday Night Live, look it up, David S. Pumpkins. Okay. Um, there's an issue here. We don't know what sigma is. What's sigma? It's the population standard deviation. And so, so here, what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out the population mean mu, right? We're trying to figure out the population mean mu based on our sample mean y bar. And what we're saying is we know y bar, but we don't know mu. Will there ever be a situation? I mean, I suppose. I suppose it's not impossible, but I can't think of any realistic scenario where this is the case, where you don't know the population mean and you're trying to figure out the population mean, but you happen to know the population standard deviation. Okay? That seems really weird. Like, I don't think that ever really happens in real life. I think in real life, you just don't know stuff about the population. You don't know the mean of the population. You don't know the standard deviation of the population. So, so when we say, hey, let's go up or down two standard errors, if each standard error is sigma divided by the square root of n, and, and that's, that's what it is according to the central limit theorem, and you know, we didn't get into the math to prove it, but just take my word for it, sigma over the square root of n, the problem is, is we don't know what sigma is. So what are we supposed to do? We don't know the standard deviation of the population. What's a reasonable thing to do? If I said, hey, can you come up with a good guess for the standard deviation of the population, what would you suggest I do? What do you think? Well, you use the, the lower value and higher value. Lower value and higher value of what? Of the well, so well, the confidence interval is determined by. A, I don't know the lower bound and the upper bound of the confidence interval until I figure out what this is. So what we can do, if I don't know the standard deviation of the population, a reasonable thing, I think, well it is, is to use the standard deviation of your sample as a guess for the standard deviation of the population, right? So. Standard deviation of the population is some number. That's like how spread out the numbers are. What we can do is we can look at our sample and we can say, hey, our sample has this standard deviation. I think that's got to be a decent guess for what the standard deviation of the population is. Okay, it's a decent guess. But when you do that, now we're just adding in extra uncertainty. Okay, so instead of sigma over the square root of n, we use s over the square root of n, the standard deviation of our sample. S divided by the square root, right? Is it all right? I hope you got to you got to be able to keep track of all of these symbols. Sigma is the standard deviation of the population. S is the standard deviation of your sample. And so we want to estimate the standard deviation of the population by using S. And so our standard error, that is the standard deviation of our sampling distribution, is going to be S over the square root of n, right? And this is a reasonable thing to do, but it does add an extra layer of uncertainty, okay? So now we've got, we're, we're, we're dealing with guesses, and then we got guesses on top of guesses, okay? So this, this makes things harder, okay? All right, we're gonna have to pause here because we're out of time. Um, and so to, 
to fix that, we're going to deal with the t distribution. So that's that's where we'll pick up on uh, on Monday. Okay, this is just our, our long lecture on kind of a bunch of this stuff. Um, so on Monday, we'll we'll get into uh, the t distribution and uh, and dealing with this. Okay. I know homework three has been a long time coming up. I'll get it posted. Okay, I'll get it posted. Also, I will post homework four. Homework four is going to be a traditional pen and paper homework problem. Okay, it's going to be like math, like it's going to feel like your uh, your math homework or something where you're going to do these like normal model probability problems and stuff like that, okay? So homework three, you'll still kind of like use R on the computer and type all of that in. Uh, homework four will be more mathy. Okay, all right, we'll pause here. Um, oh, last view quiz answer, thank you. What was it? D, D as in dog, D as in dog, last view quiz answer, so we'll end. I didn't assign any day to camp this week, okay? I wanted you guys to meet with your groups. All right, I hope that's going well. I hope you guys are zeroing in on a data set, and, uh, and I think most of you have picked a, scheduled the time to meet with me next week, so that's great.